so we were uh, talking about two random variables so the joint the description of two random variables is given by so two random variables x and y with a joint density function fxy a non negative function the area under that over the two variables is one so the problem that we have been looking at is uh, given a function of two random variables so we went through a few examples x plus y x minus y x over y etc all these are physical in uh, this is the first one is signal plus noise etc find the pd of of the density uh, the new variable z remember z is a random variable because it is a function of two random variables so i want to continue this over a few non linear functions like minimum and maximum today and then we will look at uh, the same problem but we will bring in two unknown random variables c and w and we can try to find out their joint density function of uh, c and w etc so let me go over uh, and remember this is a open ended for problem in other words you can make up all sorts of problems all sorts of functions so there is really no end to this so let me talk about uh, minimum and the maximum of two random variables <clears throat> so more generally once you can deal with uh, two random variables we can talk about a minimum of many random variables x1 x2 x3 etc xi etc x and you can talk about so i'm going to this is the notation that's used and we can talk about the maximum also of x1 x2 etc x so this is uh, x so these are called these come under order statistics in other words we are reordering them so if you reorder these random variables such that uh, uh, the remember x1 x2 are uh, different random variables and depending on the values if we reorder we'll get a new set of uh, random variables i'm going to call is x subscript to 1 to x at y n so this is your minimum and this is the maximum and the something which comes uh, the mode is somewhere here also so if you have 2n plus 1 random variables mode will be the n plus 1 question is we want their density functions joint density functions etc but let me start with to make it simple let me start with the two random variables before i do that let me tell you an example where or the relevance of these things so these are called you can also think of in economics and otherwise uh, the worst case the worst case and the best case uh, perf performance etc so if you have a chain remember a chain has got a, a many links link 1 link 2 link 3 etc so if any one of the link rips off the whole chain is useless so if x1 x2 x3 x3 x and represents the tensile strength of each link then what will be a good representation for the whole strength of the chain anyone yeah minimum of x1 x2 x3 x and will be will represent it doesn't matter what uh, if all of them are very strong except one that that weak one will dictate the strength of the chain and the same thing in your body right you have uh, this uh, you can uh, sort of uh, see where this is going you have uh, everything going for you uh, good eyes good heart but if your liver is no good so that's also the same thing right the weakest one will affect the health uh, the most uh, another better example is uh, suppose this uh, you know you you manufacture tube lights or something and uh, so quality control you you maybe you put a 5000 of them or a, a decent number 1000 of them in a room and uh, and just switch it on so the whole idea is uh, see how long it would last and so if uh, and uh, you know depending on then you can claim that the average life the average is just the lifetime of all of them divided by n right 
5,000. So if average is uh, uh, 10,000 hours, you can uh, you declare that. But the trouble with that approach is uh, finding the average may take a long time because these life bulbs, maybe some of them will go on after 5,000 hours, but some of them may go on forever. It may take years and years for all of them to sh shut off. So you can see the average is not a good uh, uh, one at that point uh, to compute. Whereas if you use the minimum, that's easy. As soon as the first one, so you switch on everyone. As soon as the first one goes out, you have that uh, number. Minimum is already known to you, maybe 2,500 hours or something. Then you, then you wait that the next one will go bad. Then you wait the next one will go bad. So you can use those or you can just use the minimum statistics. Similarly, you can see the max. If uh, X1, X2, etc. represents the snow or uh, snow levels, snowfall in a city, then the maximum will give you an idea about how much resources you should put for next year. Because uh, next year, what can, uh, the amount of snow, if you want to be safe, you can say it's going to be maybe beyond the maximum. <coughs> Excuse me. Or around the maximum. Or you can see that the maximum gives you a worst case uh, statistics. So minimum and maximum are in that sense useful. So what is our problem? Our problem is finding maybe their joint density function or uh, let's see, start with the density functions of minimum and maximum. So we'll start with maximum. So you have two random variables, X, uh, X and Y. So find the density function of uh, Z. Uh, so, uh, so we'll start with the distribution function of Z. That's probability of uh, Z less than or equal to Z. But Z is given to be maximum of X comma Y less than or equal to Z. Now what? Max and min are nonlinear functions. So what do we do? So this is where on the other hand, if you look at max, it's easy to uh, uh, astonishingly simple if you split the whole region in this way. If x is greater than or equal to y, what is max? x. And if x is less than y, y is max. So, But x and y are linear. So there is a way you can linearize it. So what I'm going to do is, if you think of this a, uh, FCC, I'm going to bring in these two conditions because their union is the whole, uh, uh, so probability of, uh, let's say A is this one. So A, of course, I can write it as A intersection S, and A, I'm going to write, yes, I'm going to write it as X greater than Y union X less than Y. So this is your S. So A is, if you look above, uh, maximum of X comma Y intersection with, x greater than y union x less than y. So this is a technique which works for all max min. Uh, so you try to understand this. So this is maximum of uh, x comma y in the section x greater than y. And remember, these two are mutually exclusive. So call it b, call it uh, b complement. So this is this is a. So this is actually you can write it as probability of a b plus probability of a b bar so this is probability of a b plus probability of max of x comma y but x less than y but see when x is greater than y look at here max is x so this you can write as uh, fcc remember we had uh, max uh, max of uh, when x is greater than y uh, max is uh, so this is max x uh, less than or equal to c max x y less than or equal to c right a is here max x y less than or equal to c so this is x less than or equal to c x greater than y plus probability of max which is, uh, when x is less than y this is y, y less than or equal to c. Okay. 
So we can split it this way. So now what? So now let's see where is this region. So I'll, I'll mark two, re this is x equal to y. So x greater than y is here. So this is for x greater than y. And uh, this is for x less than y. So then we just have to mark this. So x greater than y, x is less than or equal to z. So let's say z is, so this is the line x equal to z. So x is less than or equal to would be this region. This wedge region. So remember, this is the point z. So if I mark, uh, here it is y less than or equal to c. So remember, z is here. So this is the line y equal to c. So y less than c would be uh, here. Uh, y less than c is uh, uh, this region. So this plus this, that's what it says. So if I put it together, it would be this plus this. So this would be like this. This is the region we should be integrating. But the, this, is, this region is same as uh, x less than or equal to z and y less than or equal to z. So we can say this whole thing is x less than or equal to z, y less than or equal to z, but that's uh, fx, y capital fx, y, z, comma, z. So that's the answer. So uh, we can, uh, so that's, that's the distribution function of Z. Uh, so just to, if Z is max of X comma Y, uh, so the distribution function of Z is, uh, we can write it this way. Whatever is the, uh, you, of course you have to look at the uh, limits and now if x and y are independent, then this becomes the product fx of z multiplied by fy of z. In that case, the dense, otherwise you, can't, you just have to do it. So here this will be the derivative of, with, so in the independent case, we have this nice formula. The, you, we can use the uv formula. So that is fx of z multiplied by fy of z plus fy of z multiplied by fx of z. And then if, you're, if you know the specific problem, you can plug it in here. So let me do the minimum now. Let's say z is minimum of x comma y. So we, we, I'll proceed exactly the same way. FCZ is probability of uh, Z less than or equal to Z, but Z is given to be minimum of X comma Y less than or equal to Z. So let me call this to be A as before. So I'm going to write A as A as. And uh, so remember minimum is what? If X is greater than or equal to Y, minimum will be what? What? Y, right. And if X is less than Y, minimum will be X. So here you can, and uh, so it's the same partition as before. A, uh, yeah, intersection with uh, X greater than Y, union X less than or, uh, Y. So if I call this to be B, this is B bar. And uh, so you can write it as AB plus AB bar. And since B and B are mutually exclusive, we can write it like this. So let me substitute for A and B now. So probability of, look at A. 
when x is b is what b is x greater than or equal to y when b is x is greater than or equal to y this is y so this is where you need to pay attention so this is when x is greater than y if you want you can write one more step and here when x is less than y look at here it is x so x less than or equal to z so let's draw these two diagrams so you need the line x equal to y as before so I'll draw the two diagrams for the two regions and add it up. So x greater than, here x greater than y, which is here, and y less than or equal to z. So y equal to z is a line like this. So y less than or equal to z would be uh, this region. But remember, it's not here, because here the where these two regions are satisfied is only here. And here, x less than c. So that would be uh, this region. And x less than or uh, and x less than or equal to z. X equal to z is here. This is x equal to z. The same point. Away. Then to the left of it. So that would be this region. So let me put these two in the next diagram, and see how that comes up. So those two, if you put it together, it will come up uh, like this. So that's FC. So this is where you need to integrate. So FCC. Remember, what I have done is I just, uh, these two, I graphically put it. Then if you take this and put it here, you'll get this region. So this region you can see is uh, same as, look at this. So this region is Z comma Z. So this region to the left is, so the region I have marked there, I can, I'm, let me draw it here. I can do it, it is this region plus this region. So this region plus this region, but I counted this minus this region, uh, I counted this region twice. So I should take out this region. So this region is, uh, remember this is x equal to c. So this is fx of z and this is y equal to z. So this is y less than or equal to z. So this is fy of z. This is the region where x and y are I'm sorry, it should be this way, right? It should be this region. So that's the region where both F A X and Y are less than Z. So that should be subtracted. So this plus this minus this is this region. So this is going to be FX of Z. Many ways you can do this FY of Z minus FXY Z comma Z. So now, uh, so that's the, if X and Y are independent, this will be the product, if X and Y are independent. Uh, so if X and Y are independent, and the Z equal to minimum of X comma Y, then FCC would be FX of Z, plus fy of z minus the product, right? So now we can take the derivative. So the derivative is with respect to z. When you take the derivative of this is fx of z plus fy of z and we use the chain rule here. So if you want, you can write it as So that's the formula. Let, let's say X and Y are independent exponential with the parameters lambda one and the lambda two. You understand what I'm saying? X is exponential with lambda, X is exponential with the lambda one, y is exponential with the lambda two. 
So we can plug it in here. This is uh, lambda one e raised to minus lambda one z, this one. Uh, this is lambda two e raised to minus lambda two z. So you need to know what is f y z, the distribution function. So let's find the distribution function of z. The distribution function of z, uh, z is zero to uh, z, uh, the density function, lambda one e raised to minus lambda one x dx. So if you integrate this lambda one e raised to minus lambda one x over minus lambda zero to z, so that's one minus e raised to minus lambda one z. So one minus fx of z is e raised to minus lambda one z. Similar, similarly, one minus fy of z. Is there a question? Yeah. What is the question? No, tell him no. You just have to follow this. Uh, so we have one minus f x of z here. I'm going to plug it in here. One minus f y of z is e raised to minus lambda to z. This is e raised to minus lambda one z. So if you multiply these two and add, you will get lambda one plus lambda two multiplied by e raised to minus lambda one plus lambda two z. Anybody? And z is positive because if x is positive, y is positive. Anyone, what is the what is the last density function that we just got? Also exponential. So you have a theorem here. If x and y are independent exponential random variables with parameters lambda one and lambda two, then the minimum of x comma y is also exponential with the parameter sum of the parameters lambda one plus. So z is exponential with the parameter lambda one plus lambda two. This is the way you solve it. Any questions on minimum and max? Uh, I mean, max, if you want, we can also, just since you asked, let me do this. What we could do is this one. I don't know, this is what uh, you said. So FZC, uh, ask him to pay attention here, what I'm going to do. So Z is less than or equal to Z. So probability of max X, I think this is what he was asking that person. So this much is true. Let us say all these random variables are independent. That's where we start with. And uh, now, uh, see whether you can uh, follow my argument. If the maximum is less than C, uh, isn't this true that each of them must be less than C? So that's the big jump here. Yang, is this what he asked earlier? Yeah, that's what I'm coming to. So if x1, x2, x3 are independent, then of course, uh, in, that's a definition of independence. This is the same as probability of x1 less than or equal to z, probability of x2 less than. Is this what the question was? Yeah, this is true. I'm sorry. So this is the same as fx1, z, fx2, z, etc. Fx. Remember, even in the two random variables, we had the same thing. If x1 and x2 are independent, it was the product of the distribution functions. So this is true. And if all the x's are identical, then you can write this to be like this. Suppose all the x's have the same distribution, capital F, then you can write it like this. So if x1, x2, etc., xn are independent and identical, 
random variables uh, then if you define z to be max of x1 x2 etc xn then we just showed that fcc is uh, i'm sorry capital fcc is uh, small f of z the to the power n so the small fc is the derivative of this this will be fx of uh, z to the power n minus 1 multiplied by fx of z so that's the density function of z if they are identical also let's say x is all the xi's are uniform in 0 to a so fxi is of course uh, x is 1 uh, not 1 1 over a when x is between 0 and a and the distribution function of x is what is it uh, x over a right so in that case if x is uniform in 0 to a this density function would be what look at here we can substitute this so this will be n the a to the power n minus 1 x to the power n minus 1 this, this one right so that's the density function i just plugged it here this is 1 over a uh, this is uh, whatever this is right so that's the that's a density function this is the density function of the maximum so if you say the flood uh, flood levels or the rainfall is uniform between zero and a inches each year. And if z represents the maximum of the rainfalls for the last 100 years, then the density function of the maximum is this one, whatever I wrote there. So if you want to make uh, a road planning or whatever, or uh, water, uh, water savings, etc. The, you obviously need to uh, worry about uh, because flood levels etc will depend on the maximum so if you take care of the maximum then hopefully the next year rainfall will be under control right but then you need the density function of the maximum so let me go to the uh, so there are Hundreds of problems. This has no end to this. Let me go to uh, the, uh, the next uh, variation on this. Finding the joint PDF of Z and W. So remember where we are starting with. Given FC, FXY, given two random variables and their joint density function. We have two functions also given. So the problem is uh, find F C W C comma W. So how will you determine whether C and W are independent or not? Anyone? After finding this, what do you do? After finding the joint density? What? How do you find they are independent? You find, what do you mean by independent? You find the marginals. Is it you find the margin of so from here you can find FCC from here you can also find FWW you take the product and if the product equals this they are independent so so you can answer questions like this so first let's find try to find out the density function of uh, joint density function of Z so we once again we can start with uh, the joint uh, the, uh, distribution function of z so that's by definition uh, z less than or equal to z and w less than or equal to small w but remember z is given to be uh, g of x y less than or equal to z and w is given to be h of x y less than or equal to w so now your uh, whole idea is that for a given z and w given these values you need to figure out where so this may be a region where this inequality is satisfied and this may be the region where this inequality is satisfied. So you just need to integrate over this region. So this answer is, so if I call this region to be D, 
uh, d of uh, z comma w because this region will obviously depend on z and w this is some function of z this depends on w so essentially the, the procedure is this so integrate the remember this is the x y domain <coughs> integrate uh, this uh, way, well, the, to keep, determine the probability we integrate only over this region so that will be the region where dx y you integrate this one of course it will turn out to be and then you take the double derivative of that that will give you the joint density function of z and w and uh, in my notes i have worked out an example so rather than working out the same example let me move on and uh, what i want to do is if uh, if these uh, these are uh, polyno uh, pol uh, algebraic functions then we have a like in the one random variable case we have a shortcut so suppose these are uh, functions like x plus y x minus y etc then let me uh, then we can uh, find out the density function using a, a shortcut so the shortcut for the one random variable was remember if you had a function y equal to gx for a particular y you find out the solutions x1 x2 so solve xi equal to g inverse y for a y and you need to figure out the values on y then you find out dy by dx evaluate it at x equal to xi or you can do dxi by dy and then uh, we had this formula right summation over all the roots 1 over dy by dx at x equal to xi fx of xi so i'm going to develop a similar formula when g and x or h are uh, algebraic functions like uh, so let's say z is x plus y or uh, w is x minus y etc one example so the procedure is more or less the same uh, so z is given to be g of x y w is given to be h of x y uh, so you pick up uh, now pick up, uh, let's say, uh, z and w. This is what we want to find out, uh, z and w. So you have, we pick up some point, the z comma w, and look where this, so you may have multiple solutions here. I'm going to mark them x, i, y, i. This is certainly possible, right? If I fix a z to be small z, and w to be small w i can solve for x and y there may not there may be multiple solutions like this so the first uh, solve for x i y i that's the first step that satisfy As I said, there may be multiple solutions. So then what I'm trying to do, I'm going to do is I'm going to make a small rectangle around here. I'm going to make Z move to Z plus Delta Z and W move to W plus Delta W. So I'm, I'm trying to figure out the probability. So I'll say, let me try to figure out the probability Z is between Z to uh, z plus uh, delta z and the random variable w is between w and w plus delta w because this if you recall uh, last week you can write this in terms of if this area if this delta z and delta w are small remember you have the joint density function here so that is simply the area under the joint density function which you can approximate it as this way that's the advantage on the left side but the uh, the trouble on the right side is for each one each one of this 
So you have to solve to find out what are the corresponding points. Let me go to the next page. So I have one point here, uh, Z comma W, and then I just drew it big. I, I, this, I moved to Z to Z plus delta Z. And W goes to, this is W, W goes to W plus delta W. So you get this rectangle. This area is easy, but if you look here, as I said, there are multiple points maybe. This point is xi comma yi. As I move z to z, uh, zw to z, remember this point is z plus delta z comma w. So I have to solve those equations again. I'm, I may not get a straight line. I may, I may get a some point here like this. When I move for this point, I may get a point here. And then when I solve for this point, which is z plus uh, z plus delta z comma w plus delta w into the original equations, I'll, I may get a fourth point here. So the problem is you need to figure out, this is true for all of them, you may get different. So you need to figure out all these areas, etc. So the, what is the, well, so the reasoning is as before, as small z and as the random variable z and w moves in this small tiny rectangle, here it could be anywhere within these uh, trapeziums or uh, etc. Whatever is that shape. So remember, this probability, probability of z is between z and uh, z plus delta z and w w plus delta w. The, this probability we can approximate it as f c w z comma w delta z delta w. The question is, well, this must be equal to when the random variable z comma y is here, in the x domain, it could be here or here or here or here. That's the whole point, the physical meaning of all these roots. So this probability is the summation of, of the probability of x being in xi or xi plus delta xi and y being between yi and yi plus delta yi. But the trouble is this is not a nice rectangle. This could be, this is of course like a quadrilateral. So we need to, if you hear the area was easy because it was a rectangle, I can move delta x and delta y perpendicularly. But then once I get the delta z and delta w, I have to take the new point is wherever it is going to be. So for example, this point is uh, wherever it is going to be. It's uh, both x coordinate and y coordinate will change. Uh, so I can um, I can write this as anyway. So it's the probability of x y being here, 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 here. But probability of x y being in any one of them is the joint density function evaluated at x i comma y i multiplied by whatever is that area. I'm going to simply call it delta i. <coughs> Remember, delta i is del let me call it delta a i. So you know it's the area. So this area is not dxi dyi, that's the whole problem. It is under that transformation. So anyway, from here we can write, this is what we were looking for. Anyway, the area is positive, so I can write it like this also, multiplied by fxy, xi comma y. So xi comma yi, you know, they are the roots. This is the, so the ratio of this area uh, multi, divided by delta c delta w. And uh, if any of you recall under transformation, this is the, this is given by the Jacobian of the transformation. So let me go to that in the next page. So remember we start with the z equal to g of xy, h equal to, w equal to h of x y then you can have uh, uh, dg by dx dg by dy uh, so this is uh, dh by dx 
dh by dy. So this, if I call it as the, uh, this is Jacobian in terms of, and then we evaluate this at xi comma yi, right? At each one of these points. So remember, it's like dy by dx. So this is going to come and sit in the denominator, or you could have done the other way. Uh, you can solve for uh, xi in terms of uh, And then you can take the derivative of dxi by dz, dxi by dw, dya by. So remember, this is like dx by dy. So that goes in the numerator. So my whole point is going back to here. You can write this as, uh, if you want, one over Jacobian over all the summations. DG, the first one in the, which goes into the denominator, fxy, xi comma yi. Or if you use the second Jacobian, second form of the Jacobian, that's in the numerator. So what are the steps involved? Let me just review them. So first you find the roots. So I'll summarize it in the next uh, slide. So remember, this is the way you have, you, get, you have the option to compute the Jacobian from the given functions. Or you can find, these are the inverse functions. You can find the inverse functions and find the Jacobian. So you will see that this one is the inverse of the other. These two Jacobians are related in this way. So either one you can compute. These functions are given. So this may be easy. Sometimes this is easier to compute it this way. But ultimately you do need to substitute everything in terms of g and h uh, or z and uh, uh, w so these xi's and yi's are in terms of c and w so if you are given just to summarize the procedure if you are given z equal to z and w as two functions the first step is solve for xi which will uh, and yi such that xi and yi of course uh, for given z comma w so you solve this equation z equal to g of xi yi w equal to h of xi comma y and you get all the solutions and of course you figure out the range of depending on the given problem find the range of g and w the second thing is find the Jacobian, either the first one or the second one. And the second Jacobian is one over the first type. One is the derivative with respect to Z and W. The other one is the derivative with respect to X and W. Third one is you substitute into this formula. I, I'm going to call this, one goes into the denominator. So FZW is... Uh, summation over all the roots, one over the Jacobian or the other way. This will be in terms of Z and W, F, X, Y, X, I, comma, Y. Remember the roots will be of course in terms of Z and W also. Why, why did the summation come up? I hope you see the, uh, see where we were coming from because uh, As for a given point, the C comma W, as you make small variable, uh, you have multiple solutions here. So when Z is here, X could be anywhere here. When Z makes small movements towards uh, in the Z direction or W direction, 
x and y could be in any one of these small uh, regions. So the probability of ZW being here is this probability, is the sum of the probabilities of xi by being either here or here or here or here. That's the sum of the probabilities because none of these regions are overlapping, etc. And then you just need to find the area of this. As I said, these are not rectangles most of the time. Depending on, it will depend on the transformation, the curvature and so on. So this is the formula you get. So let's do an example on this. Uh, we do a famous example. There are probably tens of examples I have done on YouTube. You should go through them. And something like this could come up in the next week test. So this is a famous problem. In other words, X and Y are independent, uh, zero mean independent Gaussian. So this is the magnitude, one is the, uh, Z is the magnitude of the two random variables. So if I write it as X plus J, Y, a, a complex Gaussian, then z is the magnitude because that's square root of x square plus y square. And theta is, you can see, as tan inverse of y by x is the phase. Um, or, or the, or what do you call the main value of the phase? Tan inverse y uh, repeats, but the principal value from minus pi to pi by 2 to pi by 2. So that's tan inverse of uh, y. So the question is, what are their joint density functions? What are their density functions, etc.? So we will. This is an example, and the same example. Three other cases I have done it on a YouTube as different problems. What are the different problems? I have done it when these variances are not equal. When you have correlation rho, none of that I am going to do it now. You just uh, type in the same thing, you will see those videos. Just uh, it's completely solved there. So, for example, you should, uh, it's very easy for you to redo this case. Take them to be, so remember the case we are doing x and y are zero mean uh, I, uh, equal variance or independent Gaussian random variables with equal variance. Uh, so, of course, the, uh, the fifth parameter is zero. So, if the fifth parameter is not zero, uh, which, you, which I have given you, you can try to redo these two problems. All you have to do is uh, watch the, those videos and then uh, do it yourself. So, let's do this here. So, z is given to be square root of x squared plus y squared. Theta is given to be tan inverse uh, y over x. So if there is one solution, x1, y1, we can see uh, one case now, uh, but something easily. If x1, y1 is a solution, then what about uh, minus x1, minus y1? Anybody? What can you say about this? Is this a solution or not? Because if you plug it in, you get the same values, right? C, C to C is also a solution. So we have two pairs of solutions. Okay, so let's find out x1 and y1. So from here you get uh, y over x is uh, tan theta, right? From here. So this gives you y equal to x tan theta. I guess you can check it. If you want, you can plug it in here. So z is, uh, and so why you put, uh, uh, so you had uh, x equal plus minus square root of one plus uh, tan squared theta. That's six squared theta. So you get uh, six squared, the square root of six squared theta is six theta. That's one over cos theta. Or this gives you x is z cos theta, which you could have guessed, right? So if x is uh, z cos theta, you plug it in here, 
So tan theta is sin theta or cos theta. So you get uh, y1 equal to z sin theta. So one way, of, see from here, uh, z is uh, plus minus x over cos theta because one this is sec squared theta. That's square root of that is sec theta. That's one over cos theta. So you get, this is one solution. And then this is another solution. So you have two solutions. So you see, you can take the derivative of, look at here, I can take the derivative of z with respect to x, then you have to deal with square root, or I can take the derivative of x1 with respect to z and so on. So one will be like dy by do x, this will be like a dx by dy. So let's do that first. This is the easier one, so I'm going to do dx1 by dz, uh, dx1 by d theta, dy1 by dz, dy you can do the other way i think in the notes it is done both the ways so look here dx1 by dc is cos theta dx1 by d theta is what minus z sine theta and dy1 by dc is uh, sine theta uh, this is simply z d uh, c cos theta right dy1 by dc so the Jacobian is uh, the determinant of the product cos squared uh, plus z cos squared uh, plus z sine squared. So that's just z. And z is positive, right? We, did we go through this? Uh, somewhere we should have said z is positive because square root of x squared plus y squared is uh, positive. And theta goes between, uh, the principal value goes between minus pi by two to plus pi by two. And there are two solutions. So we have, I think the first part is done. So we are ready to plug it in. So FCW, Z comma W is summation over two roots. We found out this Jacobian, FXY, X1 comma, XI comma Y. So this is, so Jacobian is what? A Jacobian is simply Z. So Jacobian is Z, let's do for one uh, solution. So this is the joint density function is one over two pi squared e raised to minus x squared, xi squared plus yi squared by two sigma squared. But look at here, <coughs> xi squared plus yi squared is Z, square root of that. So xi squared plus yi squared is Z squared. So this is going to be Z squared. I have two solutions here. So, but xi squared plus y, yi squared is z squared. So I can write this, remember there is no other i, so I can write two multiplied by z divided by two pi sigma squared, e raised to minus z squared over two sigma squared. z positive, theta less than pi by two. Two, two cancel. So the final answer, the joint density function is this one. Okay, now how about the marginal density functions? <coughs> the question is, are Z and W, uh, Z and theta independent? I don't even see theta. So remember, look at the problem. Look at the problem. Uh, C depends on X and Y. Theta depends on X and Y. So what will you say about uh, Z and theta? Dependent or independent? Both depend on X and Y. They are dependent or independent? Just from common sense. L look at it again. Z depends on X and Y. You can see it. Theta depends on X and Y. So what about Z and uh, W or Z and theta? Yes? Anyone? What? 
why independent it depends c depends on x and y theta depends on x and y so if nothing else is given uh, from here you would tend to say they are probably dependent so let's see what happens so we have the joint density function i am going to find the marginal density functions of both so this i have to integrate out uh, theta theta goes from minus pi to pi so I, let me so this is going to be what was it z over pi sigma squared e raised to minus c squared over 2 sigma squared d theta so this whole thing has no d no theta so this goes outside so the answer is d theta is theta minus pi by 2 to pi by 2 is pi so this is going to be 1 over pi i'll write it here 1 over pi sigma squared e raised to minus e squared over 2 sigma squared multiplied by pi pi cancels so the answer turns out to be there's a z here right z over sigma squared e raised to minus e squared over 2 sigma squared z positive that's the density function of uh, z anybody recognizes this one so this is Rayleigh of course the magnitude is Rayleigh so let's find out theta theta is we have to integrate out z w is theta here and z goes from 0 to infinity so I take the joint density function again so 0 to infinity z over sigma squared e raised to minus sigma squared over 2 dz so I'm going to substitute z squared over 2 sigma squared to be u so the derivative is a z dz over du equal I mean 2 over 2 2 2 cancels 2c two, 2 2 cancels du c dc over sigma squared so i hope you see that 1 over pi goes outside then you have integral 0 to infinity simply e raised to minus u du but this is 1 so the answer is 1 over pi that means theta is uniform theta goes from minus pi by 2 to pi by 2 and if you take the product of this and this, you get back to uh, the other one. So let me uh, summarize it here. We have the, we found out the joint density function to be one over pi sigma squared. And we found the Z to be Rayleigh. And we found theta to be uniform. But if you take the product of this, you get in this is a you get the original one. So this is a case where uh, the joint density function equals the product. So actually, this means uh, z and w are independent, even though they depend on the same functions. So this only happens in statistics. You may come out from the same functions. Oh, uh, but they are uh, independent in this particular. So this is a good example. I remember sometimes I wrote the W. The W is the same as uh, theta. Uh, you could have written W or theta. I guess sometimes I used. Uh, what did I start with? Yeah, I started with theta. Theta is tan inverse of y over x. So this is all correct. Uh, so this is a theorem. So I'll write the theorem here. If x and y are, we, what we just proved, are zero mean independent random variables.
uh, with uh, common variants sigma squared and then c equal to at the magnitude and the magnitude and the phase what we just discovered is magnitude and phase are independent random variables one is uh, magnitude is Rayleigh phase is uniform this is what we just uh, derived it so this is a theorem the magnitude was Rayleigh And the phase is uh, was uniform. Now, if you say, look, my phase only went from minus pi by two to pi by two. If you say the phase should have gone from minus pi to pi, that just to two theta. So multiply theta by two theta. You know how to find the density function. If theta is uniform, two theta will be uniform. Call it phi. So phi is uniform from minus pi to pi, and the density function is one over two pi. That's all but the, the independence all will stay the same. So what I'm trying to say is if you make any one of these assumptions, there are three assumptions we are making. Zero mean, suppose you try to change this, zero mean independent common variance. So you have, so I have videos where I change each one of them and then this will immediately be false. So if you make the common variance to be sigma one squared and sigma, in other words, you have zero mean, but they are also independent, but the variances are not equal. Sigma one squared, sigma two squared. And then uh, all, this result is not true. Something else is true. They are not independent anymore. And similarly, if the random variables are dependent, then again, these will be, to be dependent. All this is done in the, and if the fifth parameter rho is not zero, this is also not independent. So you, you look through this case, what if uh, x, y uh, mean and uh, means are not zero, or what if sigma one squared is not equal to, so this is one case, this is other case, sigma one squared is sigma two squared are not equal. Third case is what if rho is, the rho is the fifth parameter in the Gaussian case, that is not zero. This is the same as the random variables are not independent. They are still Gaussian. So in this problem where X and Y are zero mean uh, independent random variables with, oh, what happened to Gaussian? So this is, uh, Zero mean independent, the most important is Gaussian here. So the theorem is, let me again, I left out the big part. If X and Y are zero mean independent, Gaussian random variables or normal random variables with the common variance sigma squared, then the magnitude and phase are independent. So what I'm trying to say is, redo this problem with uh, X and, y, X and Y are jointly Gaussian still. But the, so you have three cases. You don't have to do all the three together. Either, any one of them is enough. If you just make a row is not equal to zero, what happens to the result? But you have to go through this. You have to find out the density functions and they, they are no longer independent. The same problem, C is uh, square root of x squared plus y squared, and W is tan inverse of uh, y over x, or theta. Uh, so the, uh, the magnitude and phase are uh, dependent. How dependent, what are their marginal density functions? So I suggest you look at those videos and try to do. So you can see from this problem, you can create multiple problems. So one simple problem you could do is X and Y are zero mean independent Gaussian random variables with unequal variance. 
that's all you are going to do sigma 1 squared and sigma 2 squared fine are they are these two random variables independent what are their marginal density functions so do that that will involve i think the bessel functions and so on but it is all done it's reasonably easy to do <coughs> etc so this is the way so let's do another easy problem So this is another example. I'll do this quickly. So the question is, uh, what is uh, C W etc. You can find you can find the marginals directly, right? So if uh, x plus y is z and uh, x minus y is uh, w, then of course you see that there is one solution. x1 is z plus w by 2 and y1 is, uh, what is it, uh, z minus w by 2. And the Jacobian, so we, See, Jacobian, in this case, uh, we can take the derivative with respect to x and y easily, right? dz by dx is 1. So I'll do this one, dz by dx. This is like dy by dx, dz by dy. So this will go into denominator, dw by dx, dw by dy. So z is, so this is 1, 1. The other one is uh, x minus y, so 1 minus 1. So the Jacobian is uh, minus 1 minus 1, so that's minus 2. Absolute value is 2. Right? There's one solution. So I think we have everything, right? So remember, the one solution is this. And how about the, so uh, look at this, the density function of x and y are here, x is here, y is here. So x plus y will be what? x plus y is z, that will be positive, right? Why? Because x is exponential, x is positive, y is positive. The density function of x and y is non-zero only here. So z is positive, how about w? Anybody? w is x minus y, positive or negative? Anyone in terms of limits, what are they? X goes from zero to infinity, Y goes from zero to infinity. How about X minus Y? What? Yeah, minus infinity to plus infinity, of course. So we figured out that. So there's only one root, so FCW is C comma W, no need for summation. One over the Jacobian, FXY, X1 comma Y1. FXY is here. FXY is E raised to minus X plus Y. So this is e raised to minus x1 plus y1, but x1 plus y1 is z. So this is half e raised to minus z, z positive. And the question is, what about w? So we have it here, is this right? So this is where you need to do, be careful. I also made a mistake, look at here. x plus y is z, that's positive. x minus y is w. So it is true, W goes between minus W and W. The way you, we have written, if this is Z and this is W, the way I have this is, Z is always remains positive and W is, uh, goes positive and negative. That's what this says. But look at, the, you have to look at the problem, given problem. Z is X plus Y. X and Y are positive. W is X minus Y. So is there any relation between these two? Anybody? 
Look at here. Z is positive. X is positive. Y is positive. You get Z if you add. What? What is greater than what? C is greater than. Again, is that correct or you can make it better? C is greater than what? So this is this is what you shouldn't miss. So the density function is only valid in this region. C is greater than. This is not given to you. This you need to figure out from the graph or from the problem. Uh, so C is greater than W is this region. This is the region where the density function is valid. If you miss this, you will say this is the whole region and that is not correct. That's why I put this problem. So the density function is easy, except that this density function is valid only here. So you can see this is getting complicated. You have to do similar problems to figure out uh, this. So if you miss this, so you, of course this will be Z is greater than W, right? That's correct. That's uh, this region. Now let's find out. Uh, so this is the joint density function. Let's find out uh, FCC. FCC means uh, or uh, I integrate on W. What you have to do W positive and W negative, two different cases. So W positive will be what integral from here to. So this is the integral, the joint density function. Integrating out on Z, Z goes from where to where? What is this point? This line is Z equal to W. So integrate from uh, Z goes from whether here or here, right? Depending on, I think this would turn out to be correct. C goes from, is if W is positive, C goes from W to infinity. If W is negative, C goes from minus W to infinity. So you can write it like this. Integration is on Z. So if I integrate this, you get half E raised to minus Z over minus uh, absolute value of WZ. So this answer will come out to be half E raised to minus W. W goes from minus infinity to plus infinity. Remember, it, what was absolutely crucial is most of you would have missed it if you don't do problems like this. Yeah, what happened? Oh, this was FWW, I guess, right? So I did this. So, oh, sorry, so let's just change it to this is FWW. Now, FCC, we should integrate out W. So for any particular C, uh, the Z, W goes this way, right? So that's easy to fit. We just integrate on a strip like this here. So if Z, C will be, remember Z is given. So this value is minus Z to plus Z, right? What are we integrating? Yeah, this is a W, right? This is W region, this is W. W goes from minus Z to plus Z because Z is greater than W, W is less than Z. So minus Z to plus C, half E raised to minus Z, then DW. So this whole thing is a constant that goes outside, half E raised to minus Z, multiplied by W, uh, multi so Z minus Z, so that becomes two Z, two, two cancels, you get the answer to be Z, E raised to minus Z, Z positive. If you multiply this with this, of course you don't get this. So these two random variables are independent or dependent? Huh? Yeah, they are not independent. So we have uh, FZW, C comma W is not equal to Because this was z e raised to minus z, this was half, uh, and here it was e raised. To. That's the valid. So this is not equal to this. So something like this could come up in the next week a problem like this.
So you need to go again. There are many problems solved there. <laughs> So essentially, all the big topics are, these two were the big topics for in terms of the probability aspects. Finding the density function of Z, finding the density, joint density function of Z and W, and figuring out there are marginals and so on. So next week also, you just need to do a lot of problems. If you want to do the next quiz uh, well, first let's see whether you do today's uh, test well. All right, I still have some more uh, details to fill up. Yeah, can you ask them any questions? Anybody has any questions before they move on? So if I define Z to be G of X, Y, expected value of Z, we have been doing this, this simply Z multiplied by, that's the average value of Z. Uh, average value of Z. But the question, but the, if you do it this way, then you need to figure out the density function of Z. Question is, can we do using the joint density function of X and Y? That's the question. So remember, if you want, you can write this as uh, Z multiplied approximately this, uh, the integration as a summation. Uh, this is going to be probability of Z between Z and uh, Delta Z, because this is FZZ multiplied by Delta Z. So if that is the case, I can replace this because Z is a Z we have, uh, an, uh, given by G X I Y I and this is the probability that uh, X is between X I and X I plus Delta X I and Y is between Y I and Y I plus Delta Y I and you have a summation here over X I and Y I because as Z moves X i y i will I have, can have multiple roots, but this is going to be f x y x x i comma y i uh, delta x i. Uh, this is just a, uh, we had developed this before, right? Delta x i delta y i. So either you can this one. It looks like we can also use this. And now the argument is as the integration summation becomes finer and finer both will go to two integrals. This will be a single integral, this will be a double integral. <coughs> so let me write down this useful formula, then we can use that to, so if z is g of x comma y, expected value of z, we can either write it as z, fzz, dz, or we can write it as g x y, the joint density function of x and y dx dy. There is no Jacobian here because it's just uh, simply the probability of uh, x being in this region and simultaneously y being in this small region. And last week we went through this, that's this probability of something being here except is just the area of this rectangle 
multiplied by f x i y i. So this formula is preferable to this because we don't have to find the FCC. But of course, if you have the FCC, so where is this useful? This is useful to uh, figure out the maybe alternate descriptions about the two random variables. So the first thing that comes to our mind is we we can define joined moments. So you just pl plug it in here. So this will be uh, x m y n f x y x comma y d x d. Or you can also have two different functions g x and h y. So this will be double integral g x h y f x y x comma y d x d y. But now suppose x and y are independent here. It doesn't always have to be, but then this will be fxx multiplied by fyy. Notice that the above integral splits into two integrals, gx multiplied by fxx dx, multiplied by H, hy multiplied by fyy dy. But if you recall, this is the expected value of gx. Uh, that's the next one is the expected value of hy. So what do we have? So we have a good result. Uh, this is an important result. If X and Y are independent, uh, then expected value of GX multiplied by HY is expected value of GX multiplied by expected value of HY. only if they are independent. So this is a useful result. So one useful parameter is this expected value of x, y. Remember, this is something similar between the mean and the variance, right? The variance is expected value of x squared. Mean is expected value of x. So we are bringing in two random variables. So this is <coughs> double integral x, y, f, x, y, x, comma, y, dx, dy. So, and uh, what happens if X and Y are independent here? What happens to this quantity? This will be, this will be equal to what? Anybody? Because this is the product of two functions. So what do you get here? All right, so that's a simple result. This is true even if you put M and N here, right? So you have expected value of X, Y. But the left side is not mean. Left side is something else. Uh, so remember, for one random variable, you had mean, which is expected value of X. And for y, you had uh, also mean expected value of y. Then you had the variance of x, which is expected value of x minus mu x, the whole squared, which is expected value of x squared minus expected value of x squared. And similarly, variance of y was expected value of y minus mu y, the whole squared, which was expected value of y squared minus expected value of y, the whole squared. So these are called variances, right? So question is, if you have two random variables, how do you bring in one parameter which says something about their joint behavior? So we can take the, the clue from here. So once again, look at variance. So variance of X is <coughs> expected value of X minus uh, mu X, the whole square. So we, we are going to define covariance of X comma Y exactly the same way. So that will be expected value of X minus mu X 
multiplied by y minus mu y. So the motivation comes from here. Look at the last two lines. <clears throat> uh, so anybody, let me ask before I go to the next page, what if x and y are independent? What happens to the last expression? Covariance of x, y. Look at there. <clears throat> what is that? Anybody? Covariance becomes equal to? X and y are independent. Zero. Why? Right. So <laughs> covariance of x comma y is expected value of x minus mu x or multiplied by y minus mu y. If I expand, you get four terms x y minus mu x y minus mu y x plus mu x. If I take expectation, you get expected value of x y minus mu x mu y minus mu y mu x plus mu x mu y. So you get. All right, now if x and y are independent, what happens? Look at here. Anybody? This is equal to? If x and y are independent, the first term becomes the product of ex multiplied by ey. So covariance will be equal to what? Zero. This is one big result. Do you, okay, uh, I hope you understood what I wrote, right? What I wrote is, so what we have is if X and Y are independent random variables, then the covariance is zero. But if covariance is zero, there is no reason to believe that X and Y will be independent. I'll do an example to show you. <clears throat> So that's the covariance. So once again, covariance is expected value of x, y minus mu x, mu y. Or you can write this in this way. So let me prove this for you. I'm going to prove that covariance is always less <coughs> or equal to sigma x, sigma y. If this is that case, then I can define a new parameter like this. What will be, suppose that, that one is true, then what will be the value on rho? Anybody? Rho will be between what and what? Rho will go between? Look again, covariance is less than, covariance can be positive or negative. So rho will be between minus one and plus one. So if covariance is zero, what will be rho? Rho will be, if covariance is zero. Covariance is in the numerator, <laughs> zero. Right? So rho is same. Rho has the same behavior as uh, uh, so. Rho is <coughs> covariance divided by sigma x sigma. That's just a constant. So rho goes between minus one and one. Rho is called the correlation coefficient.
So if x and y are independent, what is the value of rho? Zero. Yeah, so they are, uh, so that's a correlation coefficient. So that means they are uncorrelated. All right, uh, rho is zero because covariance is zero. So if rho is zero, what can you say about their independence? Anybody? If they are uncorrelated, what can you say about their independence? You cannot say anything. They may be independent or may not be independent. So I am going to show you that relation first. <clears throat> what I am going to show is this relation. So let's define z equal to ax plus y. Then expected value of z is a mu x plus mu y. Variance of z yeah till the All right, so you can follow this up, I guess. So remember, variance is a non-negative number. So what we have is a squared multiplied by, this is the variance of x, and this is two, minus 2a, two this is the covariance of x comma y by our definition, and this is the variance of y. So let me write it in the other page, next page. So if you define z to be this way, we get uh, variance of z is a squared variance of x minus 2a covariance of x comma y plus sigma y squared must be positive. So if I plot this, this quadratic goes like this. I'm plotting it as a function of a. It's positive. So this is sigma z squared. But this is a quadratic in a. Where are the two roots? Anyone? What happened to the roots? If it is, if the function is above y, uh, the x-axis, the roots are? Huh? Positive, then I should see, be able to They're see. Imaginary. The, imaginary roots. That means what? The discriminant is? Negative. Negative. So let's find the discriminant. Remember, this is your a coefficient. This is the discriminant is b squared minus 4ac. So B is here, what is it? Two covariance. So that's B is two covariance of X comma Y squared minus four. A is here, sigma X squared. B, C is here, sigma Y squared. Must be less than negative. So that's the same as saying covariance of X comma Y squared minus sigma X squared, sigma Y squared must be less than zero. Or covariance of X comma Y squared is less than or equal to sigma x squared, sigma y squared. So we have, if you take the square root, you get covariance of x comma y over sigma x, sigma y squared is less than or equal to one. But this is rho x y squared. So we have proved rho x y is less than or equal to one. So rho is between minus one and plus one.
So the random variables uh, in terms of correlation, rho equal to zero is uncorrelated. Rho equal to plus minus one is called XY coherent, completely coherent. So in wireless multipath, when a signal goes and comes back, if, the, uh, if you have a direct path X and a, a return path Y, X and Y are this case, they are coherent because if just the same signal uh, goes and comes back from return. Multipath is coherent return, so that will be this case. So we can covariance and correlation coefficient is one and the same thing. So if I give you a density function, this is your job. Find out the correlation coefficient. So take these two random fxy, let's say fxy, x comma y. Call it a constant in this region. My question is what is the correlation? So you go home and do this. So remember correlation coefficient is covariance, which is expected value of xy minus mu x mu y. So you need to find out five, five things. This, 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 and this. Then you can find out the correlation coefficient. So the only thing new is expected value of xy, which is this. So if it is a constant, remember this area is, let's say uh, this is one. So area is half, this constant is two. <coughs> so my question is, uh, what's the correlation? I don't know the value, but you just have to go home and do it. So remember, we proved because rho is uh, rho is covariance over sigma a sigma y because covariance is zero, correlation is zero. So if x and y are independent, uh, they are uncorrelated. What I am trying to show, tell you is that if x and y are uncorrelated, they, uh, they don't have to be uh, x y not necessary. They don't have to be independent. Maybe, may not be. This is always true, the top. So let me show you this through an example in the next. So I'm going to construct a case where uh, rho is zero, but uh, X and Y, that's what I'm going to do, okay? I'm going to construct an example for you. Then looking at my example, see whether each of you can construct a different example. So rho is not bad. Rho tells you something about the random variables. Their correlation, their some dependency. So if rho is zero, they are uncorrelated. That means they have no correlation. That doesn't mean they are independent. They, they are somewhere in between. But of course, if rho is not zero, then they are definitely dependent. Because if they are independent, they must be, they have to be uncorrelated. So they are dependent, then they are not going to be uncorrelated. So consider this example. I forgot. All right, so let's see. All right, let's see, we start with x, y independent. I'm trying to construct something, you'll see. Let's say independent exponentials. I'm taking parameter to be one. So of course, x and y are here. Let me define z to be x plus y, or w to be x minus y. So I'm going to work on Z and, uh, Z and W. Anybody, what is the uh, mean of W? Remember X and Y are identi in, independent, identically exponentially distributed random variables. So what is the mean of W? Anyone? You, without computing, you should be able to tell me. 
Anybody has any idea? W is x minus y. X and y are identical. So what's the mean of W? Ex minus e y. Ex minus e y. All right. What will be that value? Anybody? Zero. Why? Because they're iid variables. They are identical. So whatever is the whatever is the mean of one is the mean of other. Actually, mean of each is one. So that we know. Uh, so uh, what about these quantities? Anybody? X and Y are independent to start with. So let's find out uh, E, Z, W. Uh, I'm trying to find out the covariance. So the covariance of Z comma W is expected value of Z by expected value of Z multiplied by expected value of W. We just found out expected value of W is zero. So I don't even need to figure out this. This is zero. What about this quantity? So this is simply expected value of Z, which is X plus Y multiplied by x minus y which is w so that is expected value of x squared minus expected value of y squared what will be the value of that one anybody why is it zero they are identical so whatever is the value is the same value so that's also zero that means covariance is zero so what is the correlation between z and w after all this if covariance is zero, <laughs> correlation is zero. No, uncorrelated. uncorrelated, right? So rho z w is zero. That means z and w are uncorrelated. Now I am going to show you that they, let's see whether they are dependent or not. So I'm going to find out if z w. I'm going to check this relation. What happens? So so let's find out f z w. So remember, z is x plus uh, y, w is x minus y. So the same thing as before, there is one, uh, one solution, z plus w by 2. <coughs> and uh, y1 is uh, z minus w by 2. And as before, z is greater than w, right? Because of the, so the density function is valid one more time here. This is something we have done. And the Jacobian is, uh, we went through this, right? One, 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 minus one. So the Jacobian is two in the denominator. Remember the, so the joint density function is e raised to minus x plus y. So we can find the joint density function. So the joint density function is one solution Jacobian is one over two e raised to minus x i plus y a only one solution. So this will come. I think this is something we did before, right? See, greater than w. We went through this, right? So I'm writing it from my memory. What was this turned out to be? Z e raised to minus z. And f w w was. Uh, Check your notes. We did this before, right? W from minus infinity to plus infinity. Of course, in this case, if you take the product of the marginals, you don't get uh, this. Uh, if you take the pro product of these two, you are not going to get this back. So, so Z and W are not independent. So we have a case, the correlation is zero. So this is an example. They are uncorrelated, but not independent. So if you are asked to find your own example, you should uh, work on it uh, the next week. See whether you can find two genuine random variables where you can show that they are uncorrelated, but not independent. So remember, if two random variables are independent, they're always uncorrelated. See, if X and Y are jointly Gaussian, I will write it quickly here. So the joint density function is some constant e raised to minus 
x squared over sigma x squared minus 2 rho xy. I'm putting means to be zero. Sigma x sigma y plus y squared over sigma y So if you find the covariance of x, y, if you go home and use the uh, expression or the, the, uh, the uh, rho x, y will turn out to be this number. Whatever is this number, that will turn out to be the rho. But you have to do some job. You have to find out the covariance and then divide by sigma x, sigma y. Whatever is appearing here will be the correlation. So this is the correlation coefficient. So let me ask you this, look at that picture. If I put this rho equal to zero, that term is gone, right? What will happen to the density function? Do you see? It becomes what? Anybody? If rho equal to zero, if I put this rho equal to zero, this becomes fxx multiplied by fyy because fxx is x squared over two sigma squared. Other one is minus y squared over sigma y squared. So we have it one exception, the jointly Gaussian case. Even if you put that will be zero. So I'm going to write it here unless x and y are jointly Gaussian. So if the x and y are jointly Gaussian, a rho equal to zero is the same as, uh, and x and y are independent. If x and y are independent, rho is zero. If rho is zero, x and y are independent. So again, I have several videos on how to compute how to find the compute if X and Y are jointly Gaussian, how to compute this, how to compute this. You should, uh, these are all different videos, but if you, uh, these are absolute moments, these are joined moments of Gaussian. And I think they, I also have with the different variances, etc. So for example, you should be able to compute X squared, uh, uh, y, uh, y squared or X cubed, Y cubed. You already, I already, uh, if X and Y are, remember these are zero mean, if they are zero mean, what's the, uh, what is the moments of X cubed and Y cubed? Anybody? X cubed, what is the moment of X cubed? Just X cubed. If X is zero mean Gaussian, what is the moment of X cubed? Anybody remembers anything? All the odd moments are zero. So it's true. Uh, but how about x cubed, y cubed? If x and y are zero mean, uh, but uh, they are correlated, of course, rho is not zero. What about x cubed, y cubed? Also zero? So you don't know, you have to do it. That's what it is done. X, x squared, y squared, what are these? So this is something you can do it now. If you have any problem, you don't have to go by brute force. You can use techniques. But so there are separate videos on this. If you just type it in, you will begin to see. So these are called higher order moments of Gaussian random variables. Because when you see something, you know, ideas will click onto you. But I, I, once you understand it, then switch off the video and see whether you can reproduce the steps. That's the first, very first thing you need to see whether how much you have grasped it. <clears throat> so check out all the, I'll send you some links, but you can, obviously you should be able to check the, at least the links. And uh, if you keep writing all the things, it should be fine. So another useful, uh, if you want to compute this joint moments, another useful, uh, 
function is the joint characteristic function. So we'll simply define it as expected value of E raised to ux plus vy. So this is like g of x, uh, u, g of x comma y. Uh, so the previous example, the previous definition, this is x u plus y v, f x y x comma y dx dy. So that's the joint characteristic function. You can see if x and y are independent, this will be the product of the, this will be equal to phi x u multiplied by phi y v if x y are independent. So I'll give you one result which you should uh, go home and uh, suppose x and y are jointly Gaussian with the mean mu x, mu y, sigma x squared, sigma y squared, and rho. So if they are dependent, then the joint characteristic function, sometimes you use omega one, omega two, e raised to j mu x, omega one, plus mu y, omega two, minus half, this is in the exponent, Sigma x squared, omega one squared, plus sigma y squared, omega two squared, minus two rho, sigma x, sigma y, omega one, omega two. This is, so you need this characteristic function to derive the joint moments. It's very easy. Of course, if the means are zero, uh, so if x, y are like this, zero mean, zero mean, uh, variance sigma one squared and sigma two squared and some rho, then the characteristic function will be half sigma x squared u squared plus sigma y squared v squared. I purposely used the two different minus two rho sigma x sigma y uv. So this will be the joint characteristic function evaluated at u comma v for two Gaussian random variables. I'm not sure whether this is plus or minus. Let me think for a second. I think this is plus. Anyway, double check that. So what is the use of this? Let me show you a quick use of this. Suppose I, suppose X and Y are jointly Gaussian. That means the characteristic function is and I'm going to take a linear combination of them. And the question is, what is the density function of Z? So if I can find the characteristic function of Z, and if it looks familiar, we may be able, so let's look at the characteristic function of Z. So that's going to be E raised to J Z omega, expected value. But this is expected value of e raised to j omega. Z is what? Ax plus by. So this I can write it as e raised to j a omega multiplied by x plus b omega multiplied by y. So this is the characteristic function of xy evaluated at a omega b omega. Look at here. So let me, uh, here I'm going to put A omega, B omega. So this is UV. So instead of U, I'm going to put A omega. Here I'm going to put uh, B omega. So this will be A omega, B omega. So let's see what you get. Uh, I'm going to put it into this function. So this is the, uh, this, this, this is U, this is V. UV is here. So instead of u, I'm going to put a omega. Instead of v, I'm going to put b omega. So you can do it mentally, but I'll do it in the next page.
Uh, so the characteristic function of z e raised to minus half uh, so i have sigma x squared a squared omega squared plus sigma y squared b squared omega squared plus 2 rho sigma x sigma y a b omega squared so this now reads e raised to minus half uh, a squared sigma x squared plus uh, 2 rho 2 ab sigma x sigma y rho plus sigma y squared b squared multiplied by omega squared by 2 there's a by 2 here because of this half so if I call this whole constant to be some constant, this reads minus <coughs> sigma z squared omega squared. But I don't know whether you remember this. This was the characteristic function of a Gaussian random variable with the variance sigma z squared. So we conclude that ax plus by is Gaussian uh, with uh, if it is started with zero means sigma z squared. And uh, so plus is correct. And you also get the variance separately here. So this is uh, any linear combination of, remember, the, the, we started with correlated Gaussian, non-independent Gaussian. Linear combination of Gaussian, jointly Gaussian random variables is Gaussian. See, I didn't do any uh, any the regions except I just use the characteristic function quickly to solve it. This is a very important result. If anybody tells me they have done through, uh, this is the first thing I ask. If x and y are jointly Gaussian, uh, and if I do x minus y, what is the density function of z? And if you start blinking there, then I know nothing has gone into your head. So remember, x plus y x minus y, 2x plus 3y, all of them are Gaussian, if x and y are jointly Gaussian. I don't need to do each case separately, like in the previous things. So once again, just to make sure you understand, let me write the theorem. If x and y are zero mean is fine, if x and y are jointly Gaussian, so they could be dependent or independent. The rho doesn't have to be zero. Rho could be, uh, then any linear combination, that is ax plus by is also Gaussian. Uh, with very, so mean is with mean. So mean is of course a mu x, plus b mu y and variance is a squared sigma x squared plus b squared sigma y squared plus 2ab covariance of uh, or, or rho sigma x sigma y. Again, this is a, a simple thing. Uh, so that's over, right? x plus y is Gaussian, x minus y is Gaussian. 2x minus 3y is Gaussian. So forget about all that. Let's take this problem. Let's find the mean and variance. This is again a standard problem. Comes all the time and a lot of people make mistakes. I don't know why. So the mean is easy, right? A multiplied by expected value of x plus b multiplied by expected value of y. You don't need a characteristic function or anything. Let's find out the variance of z. So by definition, this is z minus mu z, the whole square, but z is ax plus by minus here, a mu x plus b mu y. a mu x plus b mu y, whole square. So let me collect the a terms together. So this is expected value of a minus mu x 
plus b minus uh, mu y that is squared. So you get three terms. The first term is expected value of x minus mu x the whole squared. Middle term is plus 2ab expected value of x minus mu x multiplied by y minus mu y. The last term is expected value of y minus mu y the whole squared. But this is the variance of x or oh, there is an a squared here, right? A squared goes outside. There is a B squared here. So this is A squared sigma x squared. This is a covariance of x comma y, which is rho sigma x sigma y multiplied by 2ab. So the and this is sigma y squared. I don't know how many times I asked this and then if I ask in the exam, a lot of people are unable to duplicate this last result for whatever reason. So remember again, any, if you start with any linear combination, the variance is given by the last expression. A squared sigma A squared, B squared sigma Y squared. So what if X and Y are uncorrelated? What's the variance? Anybody? Uncorrelated means rho is zero. So what's the variance? Look at the last expression. Middle term will be gone, right? So if x, if rho is zero, what is the variance of a x plus b y? Anybody? Tell me. A squared. Sigma x squared. Then. Sigma y squared. So what's the variance of x plus y? Anybody? If rho is zero, what's the variance of x plus y? And what's the variance of x minus y? Sigma x squared plus sigma y squared. Do you see anything here? If you add or subtract two random variables, what happens? If you add or subtract two uncorrelated random variables, variances. If you add a signal plus noise, or you add noise, you subtract the noise from the signal. What's the if signal and noise are independent? That means they are uncorrelated. What happens to the variance? Look at here. If you add or subtract two random variables, variances. The same. Same. So that so by in the case of two random variables, you cannot say I'll subtract it and make some variance less. You cannot. Subtraction is same as the addition. You have to do some other signal processing. That's the first uh, expression. If the random variables are independent, that is no longer true. If the if they have correlation, let's see what happens to correlation. Suppose rho is not zero. What is the variance of x plus y? Anybody look at your x book variance is what a and b are one so this is sigma x squared what is the middle expression you have to look at your notes what is the variance of uh, uh, x minus y anybody Yeah, here minus two a and b are one sigma x sigma y. So if rho is not zero, look, do you see you can make the variance smaller by subtract uh, adding or subtracting? What happened to rho here? There is a rho here. So if rho is not zero, which one has lower variance? Anybody? So let me make it simple. Let's say sigma x squared and sigma y squared are equal to sigma squared. Then the variance of x plus y is sigma squared multiplied by one plus rho. Variance of x minus y is sigma squared. So which one has lower variance? Anyone? Which one? What if rho was negative? Rho could be negative. 
So it depends on, so if rho is positive, this one has lower variance. If rho is negative, x plus y has lower variance. So you can minimize the variance if you, uh, by taking the proper combination. So there's a lot of things to do. Let me see what, what else I'm missing. So next week I'm going to do, next week we'll finish the random variables, conditional and whatever is missing. And also I wanted to do some discrete examples. So let me give you this problem. Z is AX plus Y. Oh, find A that minimizes, uh, find the value of A that minimizes the variance of Z. See whether you can go home and do it. X and Y are, let's say X and Y are, uh, of course, uh, rho is not zero. In other words, X and Y are correlated, not Gaussian or anything, correlated random variables with different means and different variances. Well, so if I take a combination AX plus Y, what is the value of A which will minimize the variance of C? See whether you can address this problem at home. So again, let me take this problem. X and Y are jointly Gaussian. That means their characteristic function is like this. I'm going to do the zero mean case it's so that I can write it easily. That'll be u squared sigma one squared, sigma x squared plus two rho uv sigma x sigma y plus sigma y squared b squared. This is the joint characteristic function. You can see rho is not zero. So X and Y are uh, jointly Gaussian. Look at what I am doing. I take two linear functions, two linear combinations of X and Y. What do we know about each one of them? Anybody? What do we know about each linear combination? Gaussian. Gaussian. We already know this is Gaussian. We know this is Gaussian. The question is what is their joint uh, density function? So easiest way is again, this is done. I'm going to ask you to find out the characteristic function. And you, uh, so you start with this characteristic function and plug in, you will need this one, plug in, in this into this, and you will see that it actually has the same form. That's what you have to show. So this has the same form as uh, if I call this to be one, same form as this one. And so then you can conclude that they are also jointly normal. That's how you conclude it. This needs a little bit work. So, so again, the way, quickly, the way you do it is like this. So you start with what you don't know, Z, W, let's say we call it uh, U comma V. So that's by definition e to the power j <coughs> zu plus vw. But z is given to be e raised to j. Z is what? ax plus by multiplied by u plus v multiplied w is cx plus dy. So you can uh, write this as e raised to j. Collect all the a to, uh, x terms together. au plus CV multiplied by X. So call this Omega one. And uh, then you have BU plus uh, DV multiplied by one. call it Omega two. So this is the characteristic function of XY evaluated at AU plus CV comma BU plus DV. Omega one, Omega two. So you can go back and plug it into this function. So this is omega one, omega two. So this will be omega one squared, omega one, omega two, 
omega 2 squared. So instead of omega 1, omega 2, you put these functions. Ultimately, you will get a UV function which will look like this. From there, you can read the mean way. So the whole point is this will okay, be Gaussian. Yes. So some, way, some mean, some variance, <coughs> some other variance, and some other correlation coefficient. So I'm going to ask you to find out this correlation coefficient in terms of the original correlation coefficient. And um, as I said, I'm going to stop here, Zeng. Zeng. Hello. Switch off the video. And next week I will uh, will complete the random variables. Remember, this is. Are you done? Did you shut off the video? All right. Everybody need to switch on your videos. These two classes have been a little bit marathon, but you do have a lot of work. If you fall behind here, you are going to fall behind. I need to see everyone's, uh, see, check whether everyone is on.